Welcome to the series, An Effective Contemporary Approach to Female Sexual Medicine. This is part one, and I'm Dr. Deborah Wickman. My disclosures are that I'm a member of the Medical Advisory Board for Lalo Intimina Corporation in an uncompensated role. I'm the principal investigator for a sponsored research study, the effectiveness of the Kegel Smart Pelvic Floor Device in Improving Female Sexual Function and Resolving Incontinence. And I do plan to discuss off-label use of testosterone and explore it in the context of its utility as part of an overall treatment program. Here's what we're going to cover. By the end of the video, part one, participants will be able to identify the importance of sexual wellness in women's lives, explain a tool to identify sexual concerns in general gynecologic practice, distinguish between low sexual desire, hyposexual desire disorder, and depression in women, and list populations at increased risk for developing sexual concerns. Healthy sex is valuable. It's been quantified that an increase in sexual frequency from once per month to once per week is like getting a $50,000 a year raise. I think all of us can relate to that level of happiness. Patients look to us as a resource for this. As gynecologists, we are expected to have answers to all questions related to genital function, especially regarding sex. Women are asking questions about how to get more meaning in their lives. They are spending more time, they're spending time and money seeking information about self-empowerment and self-improvement. It's important that we know what our patients are investing in and the products they're using. I ask patients to tell me about all the activities in which they participate. Why are women seeking? The answer is that the prevalence of sexual problems is fairly high. Low desire is the most common concern at 38%, 38.7% overall. Hyposexual desire disorder occurs when a woman experiences distress about her low desire. And you can see that this is less prevalent at an overall rate of 27.5%. The prevalence of overall sexual concerns increases with age. But the middle age group, 45 to 64 year olds, have the most distress. Interestingly, this coincides with perimenopause, menopause. And then 40% of women with distressing sexual concerns have concurrent depression which makes sense as so many symptoms overlap these conditions. We know sexual concerns are prevalent in our patient population, but how often are we asking about it? Well, two thirds of the time, we ask the basic questions to confirm yes or no, is there sexual activity? But less than half of the time, are there any further assessments made? This is how we build trust with our patients to allow them to feel secure in sharing further. In recent years, the nomenclature was changed as DSM-5 evolved. Now, hyposexual desire disorder and sexual arousal disorder are combined into disorders of female sexual interest and arousal. Dyspareunia and vaginismus are now combined into genitopelvic pain and penetration disorder. And orgasm disorder still stands alone. It's important to note that all the entities I've just described must be present for at least six months and for at least 75% of the time in order to meet the criteria for disorder. Women are at risk for developing sexual concerns at any and all of the major life milestones and whenever their lives shift into change and stress. I'm going to focus on these first three as they are very pertinent to general obstetrics and gynecology practice. Hysterectomy is the most common major gynecologic surgery and a significant number of women will feel like their sex life is altered afterward. Orgasms are especially affected when the patient has a significant contribution from the uterus or cervix. Painful sex is more of an issue if oophorectomy is also performed due to the ensuing hormone changes, if untreated. 
there are clues before surgery to let you know there may be difficulty. It's important to pick up and document conditions like depression and assess the status of sexual function before you make surgical changes. First, it will improve outcome for everyone involved to intervene earlier. And you do not want to be blamed for negative changes noticed as she becomes more aware and focuses on her situation. She and her partner may have unrealistic expectations, like surgery will fix their sexual problems, even if she did not confirm that idea with you, the surgeon, beforehand. The sexual desire screener, or decreased sexual desire screener, is a useful tool the patient can fill out in a couple minutes while she waits in the exam room. It involves four yes or no questions about sexual desire, dealing in the past, whether it has changed now, if she's bothered by it, and would she like it to improve. The second part of the screener allows her to circle any factors she feels might be present and contributing to the situation. Here is a good opportunity to open the dialogue about her status and follow up on her expectations. For example, she may believe that having a hysterectomy will improve her sexual desire, and it might, depending on how much influence the problem exerts on her sexual satisfaction. Examples would be like heavy bleeding, pain, or incontinence, but it is important to make her aware that there are other factors at work and she can see you as an ally in addressing the problem fully. The Female Sexual Function Index, or FSFI, is a gold standard tool for research, but cumbersome and time-consuming for busy private practice use. It reflects the six domains of sexual function and allows comparison when completed at subsequent points in time. An abbreviated version, the FSFI-9, has been validated and is useful when assessment of sexual function is a secondary endpoint, as is the case in looking at our at-risk populations. The Patient Health Questionnaire, PHQ-9, is easy, quick to fill out, and can incorporate into most electronic medical records. It can also be addressed in a visit ahead of surgery. Earlier intervention is best, so ideally, this can even be part of a new patient assessment, but should precede any surgical procedure. So, at the pre-op visit, assess for depression and document findings. Inquire about sexual activity, genital sensation, and orgasm, especially pertinent during the physical exam. Postoperatively, tell the patient what to expect regarding intimacy and review her expectations. Let her know what to be concerned about and by when. Have a low threshold to refer to sexual medicine or sex therapy when needed. Now we're going to talk about pregnancy. Prior to pregnancy, 80% of women are having sex five or more times per month. By three months, postpartum, that has dropped to 40%. This is a huge adjustment period for the couple. Be a resource by asking about it. Let them know that if sex is a problem after the postpartum visit, she should come back in for further help. Have a plan that provides help. Otherwise, they often don't come back until a year later when it's time for their next well woman exam. There are barriers to resuming sexual activity, especially at the prior level of function. There is a psychological, sociological overlay to these physical complaints, and how they normalize is affected by the woman's support system, coping skills, and integrity of the relationship with her partner. We can address and improve many of these barriers if we just ask and become aware of them. By six to 12 months, hormones should have normalized unless the woman is breastfeeding. Although the majority of women will return to prior normal function, it is the 12% who develop distressing sexual concerns that we need to screen and be aware of and help. Here there are some red flags to look for with regard to predicting sexual difficulties after the first year postpartum. Lack of sexual activity during first trimester Older maternal age and history of pain, painful sex predating the pregnancy 
are all positively associated with distressing sexual concerns. Adding an infant to the relationship, even a much desired addition, can create tension for the couple. Breastfeeding can cause strain on a relationship despite a high level of oxytocin being produced. The cuddle hormone is being directed toward the infant rather than the partner much of the time. Although some women report feeling increased eroticism due to larger breasts, nipple stimulation, and even uterine contractions, breastfeeding past six months is a risk factor for sexual problems. Of course, breastfeeding provides so, much, so many benefits for the baby and mother-infant bonding but it is something we as physicians should address and provide helpful input, even if just to bring it out in the open, normalize it, and let them know they are not unusual in experiencing this. We've explored ways to screen for sexual concerns and identified vulnerable populations that we commonly encounter. In the next video, I will discuss some treatment options to offer patients without needing to be a specialty sexual medicine clinic. Please join me in part two. Thank you.